<laughs> the playwright David Ives has been compared to legendary writers such as Samuel Beckett and Harold Pinter, but he says he is more in common with Monty Python and the Three Stooges. His latest production, All in the Timing, is a series of six one-act plays, and it is one of the hottest tickets in New York. Audiences are out of control with laughter, and he's tickled even the toughest of critics, and we're very pleased to have him here. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> your friends are even saying to you, Pinter I'm stealing... Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, what you really want to do... You d there's a great quote from you somewhere, which you basically said about... Tell me how you feel about humor and about laughter and about comedy. Well, uh, what I, uh, the Harold Pinter is well and good is what I usually say. Um, uh, I, <laughs> but I not for me all the time or what? Not for, not for laughter. I, uh, I, uh, I admire Harold Pinter. I admire Samuel Beckett, God rest his soul. And, uh, though he wouldn't say that. And, uh, um, but I, I watch Sid Caesar, The Three Stooges and Monty Python with envy, you know, I mean, because of the, because the jokes are so good. And, um, and so I, I, I can't impress on people enough that, yes, I, I, I am aware of Harold Pinter, but most of all, I'm trying to be funny, I guess. Yeah. I, but why, because what? Do you think that, th that that's the best way to treat serious subjects, or...? Uh, is there any other way to treat serious <laughs> subjects in this <laughs> day know. and age? What else, <laughs> what else can one do with them? Um, to be serious about serious subjects is somehow redundant, yeah, I right. guess. Okay, um, so you look for the, a moment of right. truth through the comedy. Right. And, right. Uh, turn things on their head a little bit, I suppose, is the, is the idea. And but here's the other question about you, David. I mean, why do you have six one-act plays? Why can't you do what everybody else does and give us three acts and leave us alone? Uh, I apologize for that sincerely, <laughs> but my producer does not. Um, I guess I have a short attention span or something. I don't, I don't know what it is, but uh, I, have been, uh, I have been writing 15-minute comedies for so long that I guess it's, uh, it's just bad habit or something. Yeah. I actually, I have written uh, a number of Full-length yes, plays, which have been done here and there, and uh, some of them quite well, and some of them are pretty good, but they tended to be uh, fairly serious stuff. And mm. for some reason, in 1985 or so, I started writing 15-minute comedies and never stopped, so it's a bad habit. Um, Let me just tell you what, tell me what the, just give me the premise for each of the six one acts that are in all the timing, because it's uh, just hilarious. Um, We're going to see a clip from one of them, but uh, go ahead, just tell me the premise for each of them. Well, sure thing is uh, a man and a woman in a cafeteria. Um, she's reading The Sound and the Fury. He wants to take her to the movies. And every time he makes a mistake in the conversation, a bell rings off stage, and they get to stop the conversation and go on from where they let off. For example, uh, he says, what's the book? I'm trying to start conversation, as we all do. And uh, she says, The Sound and the Fury. And he goes, ah, Hemingway. Ding. What's the book? <laughs> the Sound of the Fury. Ah, Faulkner. And they get to go oh, on. Yeah, yeah. And they ultimately not only get to go to the movies, but sort of pass on into eternal bliss at the end of the play, at the end of 15 minutes, which is what we all want anyway. All right. The second? The second is Words, 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 which is based on the old idea that three monkeys typing into infinity will sooner or later produce Hamlet. And the play sort of explores what the three monkeys would, ta would talk about while they were sitting at their typewriters, griping as, as writers usually do. It's sort of the old... Um, Dick Van Dyke show with three monkeys instead of him, Maury Amsterdam. Well, television and, really had an influence on you. Well, up until the time I was 15, which is when I stopped watching it. You know, I've, I've missed all of television <laughs> like, for the last... You haven't seen anything since Van Dyke anything. and Caesar. I thought, oh, like, it's good. I turned TV on yeah. the other night to see Bilko, and it wasn't on anymore. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> yes, well, um, you're probably better off for it. <laughs> oh, please. All right, take a look. Here's a clip from Words, Words, and Words. All right, here it is. The three monkeys becoming Hamlet. Chip! <laughs> <laughs> 
Three. Now, just the scenarios, the Trotsky scenario. Uh, Trotsky is uh, uh, Leon Trotsky sitting an in, axe his, in his head. He has an axe in his head, and he, we is, know he's he is killed in Mexico he by one of Stalin's uh, assassins. assassins. Right. And the play begins with him writing a speech to the proletariat with a mountain climber's axe in the back of his head, and uh, his wife breaks the news to him that the axe is there, and. Um, <laughs> It's him trying to deal with it, you know. Yeah. I, I with mortality and... With mortality and what, what you have for supper when you have a mountain climber's axe in your head, you know. <laughs> Tell it, me where this idea came from. That came from the New York Times, actually. I was reading that. <laughs> well, yeah, well that, that's your family, <laughs> for God's sakes. I know, As your I friends know. friends say, they've been so good to you in terms of their criticism of your work, you clearly are of the family. Um, uh, and thank God for the Times. I'm glad that they laughed, you know. I, I, uh, but John Simon and others have and said nice John things. Simon and others, uh, surprise, surprise. But... Uh, 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 Trot I was reading an article about Trotsky one day that mentioned that he had been hit with a mountain climber's axe and lived for 36 hours and I was on the phone with a friend and I said this is the funniest thing I've read in years. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'd better do something with this before Saturday <laughs> Night so Live does. It. Yes. <laughs> before the common turn writes, starts writing comedy and so yes. I, uh, I said well what do you do with a mountain climber's axe in your head and so I thought I'd explore it. <laughs> And then there's uh, the universal language, which yeah. is about a young woman with a stutter who right. comes to a school for something called Unamunda, which is this Esperanto-like language, which the, which the teacher is making up as he goes along, but she doesn't quite notice that. And so uh, he teaches her uh, a language which is supposed to unite all humankind, and, it's, uh, and little does she know that she's making it up as she goes along. And so they fall in love, needless yeah. to say, which is what theater's all about anyway. What? Uh, falling in love. Falling in love. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's why I go to the theater. I go to the theater to watch people fall in love. You know, why do we live? Um, no, I go to fall in love and to laugh. And to laugh. If I don't laugh or see somebody fall in love, what, I've wasted my money. Yeah. Um, then there's Philip Glass buys a loaf of bread, which is five minutes and 18 seconds of the complete works of Philip Glass. <laughs> Um, for those who don't have, you know, Philip don't have this? years. Of, How does Philip feel about he this? He hasn't shown up. I don't know oh, why. No kidding. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't either. I think he said he'd be embarrassed. I, I, oh, well, I can't I'm not embarrassed. Why. I'm not embarrassed. I wouldn't why be should, either. Why should he be? Um, and so it's, it's Philip Glass in a bakery trying to buy a loaf of bread, and suddenly we go into kind of what's going on in Philip Glass's mind, and it sounds very much like Einstein on the beach, except it's about bread. And... Um, that piece is all spoken in rhythm yeah. and uh, and uh, is is an homage to the homage. master. Homage. Or, or <laughs> domage, I suppose. It's a domage. All right. to <laughs> why do you, a couple of quick things. One, why, it works for you. Why the 15 minute as a, as a particular period of well, time? Well, I, I don't know. You know, certain people have certain forms. Tony Kushner works in four hour forms. <laughs> I work in. No, he works in seven hour forms. Seven hour forms. <laughs> we're, the, we're the Laurel and Hardy two, of the uh, American. Millennium and Perry Strike. That's right. Yeah. We're the Laurel and Hardy of the American theater. Yeah. You know? But um, I don't know. Are you, it's a you're form the that Alpha appeals. and the Omega. We really are. And when we stand next to each other, we balance out. There's a sort of conservation of time <laughs> theory. If you put one of my plays next to yeah. Perry Strike. Well, actually, you know what's interesting about the two of you is that, is that I just had Tony at the 92nd Street Y, where I do interviews there as well. And they, um, I mean, about both of you, when the work came out, and Angels in America, and then some of your work, people say, it, it's the savior of Broadway. It's the savior of the American theater. Does that say, does that say how good you are? Or does that say how bad everything else is? Uh... Uh, that's a tough question to put to me. Uh, let's ask my fans. I don't know. Let's <laughs> no, ask I mean, the is, Times. Is there... I think the theater has been a little dry. A uh, dearth, would you say? There's been a there's been a good dearth of of plays uh, for yeah. the past few years, I think. Rather than just sequels and revivals, no matter how good uh, they are. I mean, Damn um, Yankees or whatever yes, it is. Yes, of course, we'd love to see Damn Yankees. I. Well, uh, are you going or not? I, 
you know what? I rarely go to the theater. I have to confess. Let me <laughs> yes. tell America, I don't go to the theater. He's in his. He's in <laughs> but his. Please go to my play. But, please, but you, please. And you write longhanded. You I write. do write. I do write in longhand. I have to um, because Why? I started. Uh, I think because I started writing plays when I was nine years old, and I didn't. I didn't have a typewriter to work on. Yeah. I, why? I mean, I read that. Why did you start writing plays? I mean, what was it about the theater uh, and and that, that convinced you? I mean, I guess you saw delicate balance, and it had some huge impact oh, on you. Too. You decided that the theater was for you. Uh, actually, before I saw Delicate Balance, I saw Pinocchio at the oh, Goodman <laughs> Theater, and that was it. That it was, was the it. most dramatic experience of my life. I, yeah. I stood and got the uh, autograph of the good fairy in the lobby. And but did you know or when you were nine that, that, I mean, that you had some talent, that, you, that this was what you would do with your life? Uh, I certainly, it certainly must have made some sort of impression. What mm -hmm. I didn't know about the theater was that everybody who, who's in the play is supposed to get a copy of the script, and so mm -hmm. I wrote it out longhand, gave it to, learned my lines. Yeah gave it to the next guy, and he lost the, the, the manuscript, so it's one of the great lost plays of David And, and he's no longer in the theater either, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to find that guy. He's got my script. He's probably published it somewhere. Also a 15-minute play. I adapted that from a 300-page novel, you know, yeah. when I was nine. But yes, I think seeing, seeing A Delicate Balance when I was 15, I, I do remember sitting in the balcony of Delicate Balance watching Hume Cronin do the... Um, the cat speech and thinking there is nothing better than this. This is the greatest thing in the world. It was like I felt like I was on a roller coaster, yeah. and I, I vividly remember it. And that was truly I, what was the it, day though? that changed Just... my life. I had never been so excited by. Uh, I was so taken into this play. The and moment and this, the, the feeling moment, the and excitement, the... And the feel of it, and the just the emotional power. And um, and so something about it spoke to me. And and I was. I was already writing plays by that point anyway, so by the time I got to college, I was in my middle period anyway. I know, you know I, that's my other question for you. These are the late string quartets. Are, are, are we now in the you? late period? <laughs> that's right. Now I, now I lapse into deafness and yeah, silence. When we get to the trilogy, we'll say the early period, the middle period, and the late period. And the late period, which started fairly yeah. early on. Tom Stoppard was a big influence. I got less than 30 seconds, and you can't answer this in 30 seconds. Stoppard was an influence? Uh, yes. Uh, another great experience was seeing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern yeah. when I was 18 or so. Or maybe it was the date I was on, I don't know, but it was a big <laughs> evening for me. I can't remember yeah. now. It was the date of seeing Rosen <laughs> Crancy. <laughs> and Tom thinks it was him, so who the hell cares? <laughs> he was yeah, all, the, uh, all in the timing is going to only be running for a short time. No, it's running into it infinity. It's at before the Hausman it Theater now, yeah. running off Broadway into infinity, as we hope. Oh, forever. It's an open-ended run, and we plan to outdo the, you know, I have the Fantastics contract. We run as long as we can, <laughs> <laughs> approaching the Fantastics. Which ran for 12 years or something? What? 12 centuries. 12 centuries. It's actually a medieval <laughs> play, but nobody knows that. <laughs> was this one from Shakespeare's play? I didn't know that. <laughs> it's one of his unknown works. <laughs> <laughs> David Ives, it's great to have you. Come back anytime. Thank really a pleasure much. to have you here. Anybody that uh, brings as much joy as you do and gets the kind of reviews you do belongs on this stage. Well, thank thank you. you very much. We thank you for joining this evening. Thank Johnny Apple and Joe Klein and all the people here, Mitch Kapoor and Stacey Horn and others talking about Internet and David Ives. See you next time.